Life is full of uncertainties and untidiness. And whenever our children meet with some untidiness or mm. uncertainties, what do we do as educators and parents? I think you see, like kids you, expect their parents to bail them out or something. Like, like ah, so you now. see, this, is a, this, this becomes a problem, right? Mm. Because every time if they get bailed out or if somebody is res- made responsible for what they do or are not able to do, mm. then they will grow up thinking that, you know, this is not my problem, right? Education Minister Chan Chun Singh has laid down the law of how parents should communicate with teachers and I want to find out why now. Welcome back to The Usual Place and I'm your host, Natasha. And to answer that question and more, I have Minister Chan with me on the show. Thank you for coming on the show. And for the first time, I also have a very special co-host, Jamie Ho, the editor of The Straits Times. I think he's angling for a permanent spot on the show, but we'll see how it goes. Well, actually, he's a father of two children, so he's going to weigh in on the issue at hand today. But Min, I want to ask you, did you get any feedback to your announcement from the work plan seminar earlier this week? Of course. Uh, Like everything that MOE does, we get all kinds of feedback. Is it good feedback or bad feedback? What, what was like the general sentiment on the ground? So I think for ge- teachers, generally, they are happy. Then they just want to know how we can execute this uh, and make that transition because uh, some of them may have uh, given their handphones uh, numbers to the parents previously. Uh, for parents, I think in general, they are very supportive. And I must say this in context. Actually, the vast majority of our parents, they are very supportive of our mm. teachers and educators. And we are very appreciative of this. But, you know, this a little the small minority. number, they can have a disproportionate effect because actually they deprive the other parents of the time that the th- educators would want to spend with the mm. kids. So you, you get the entire spectrum. Yeah. Mm. So I, I, I um, okay, so let me just uh, uh, sound it out specifically. So basically you, you highlighted that teachers are not required to share their personal phone numbers and mm. they do not need to respond to work-related messages after school hours. Now, I want to ask you, how do we get to this point where parents uh, need to be told not to communicate with teachers? Like, isn't this kind of like a natural behaviour or like social skill that they should have? Okay, so maybe one uh, small clarification first. Mm. Uh, in fact, my wife asked me, they said, okay, you told me that I can't communicate with my uh, parents. Uh, my, 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 how come you can, you say that the parents cannot communicate with the teachers? What about the special needs kids? Okay, so there are difference. So even in my work plan speech, I highlighted, you know, mm. there are some children with uh, special needs and higher needs. And I think they are in regular contact with the teachers, I think that's perfectly fine. I think mm. what we are trying to eradicate that are those what I call less urgent, not so important things. Not so much that the teachers want to respond, but I think perhaps in responding, we deprive the children of learning to be independent mm. and to be reliant. So, I mean, one uh, example that I say, you know, it's like if your child forget the spelling list, that's not life and death. And if just fail lah, it's okay. It's not about <laughs> failing, you know, when you, take a, you, when you get a spelling list, there are two things that you're actually trying to learn, yeah. right? One is the spelling yeah. itself. But the other one, which is perhaps more important than the spelling, is your sense of responsibility, mm. right? Learning to take charge of your own responsibilities mm. rather than to have your teachers or your parents to coordinate all this for you, right? So I think the second lesson is even more important than the first. It's a life lesson that maybe they skip out on if yes. the parents come yeah. in lah. Okay, well... You've been education minister now for like three years, you know, like, are there any shocking behaviour that you've witnessed from parents that you, I think, like, maybe it's worsened over the years or it has improved? Like, what's your take on the last three years as education minister? I don't think many things shock me. Um, (laughs) It's not that it shocked me. I usually just get perturbed because it wastes a lot of my staff time. Mm. Uh, So what are some of the usual tactics that, you know, people try to get their way? Mm. Uh, Writing to the media. Uh, to get you all to publish a story and not that many, uh, not, not, not that many. <laughs> so I wish sometimes. you got more, but not that many. <laughs> so sometimes they, they do this: mm. uh, write to media, uh, write to prime minister, mm. write to opposition uh, members, uh, write to foreign media. Uh, uh, extreme case: uh, write to CPIB, you know, write to oh. police, and uh, send lawyer letters. I mean, we have some numbers of this. They are not small. Uh, they are not big. Sorry, but the impact is disproportionate because it wastes a lot of time. Mm. for the entire system and it locks up the entire school leadership rather than... Because they have to deal with... They have to deal with it. So they they have to address it. So it's actually quite unfair to the other parents and to the other children, you see. Mm. If one parent starts doing this and then the rest will feel like, you know, why why is this... How is this Mm. fair to me and my my kid, you know? Okay, so so what do you think 
is this is a symptom of like it's is part of a perhaps it's part of the larger issue of overparenting. Really. Well, I guess yeah. there's no one reason for all such behaviors, but I can think of a few, mm. and there are various hypotheses. One is perhaps, perhaps now that we have more, we, we know more. As parents, we tend to perhaps want to do even more. Mm. It's a very natural tendency, right? Uh, whereas in the past, maybe our parents don't know so much. Our parents generally trust the teachers more. And then, but to, today, I think a lot of people feel that, well, I'm also highly educated and I should have a view on certain things. Mm. So this could be one. A second possible reason is perhaps we are very into this performance culture. I want my kid to perform. I want mm. it to be done. But you know, it's just like the spelling example that I say. You know, it's one thing to perform well at the spelling test. Right? There's a short-term performance. But there's another thing about the longer-term performance is my kid growing up to be more disciplined, mm. more self-reliant. And I think the second lesson is perhaps even more important. And sometimes as parents, we just look at the short-term performance outcome without understanding that we might inevitably breed what I call a crutch mentality in mm. our kids to think that you know, whenever something happens, somebody must be responsible for what is happening. Okay. So I, I think these are some of the possible reasons mm. that we can think of. Yeah. Uh, so I don't think the parents do it perhaps intentionally, but mm. sometimes in a way that we do it, uh, it might have uh, unintended consequences. Okay. Jamie, what kind of parent are you? Well, okay, my, my kids firstly are in their 20s. They're, okay. they're, they're probably going to be no deeply embarrassed watching me doing this talking about <laughs> parenting. But, but what I, I actually also wonder, I mean, firstly, I, I, I think I personally uh, supportive of what you said. But at the same time, I'm wondering really what drives such behavior, right? It cannot be that they, they, are, they are behaving like just because of the pursuit of academic excellence, right? Mm -hmm. So is, is there some deeper anxiety that we need to address amongst parents? Because unless you, you address their root cause, what is it that's causing them to behave like that? It, it, otherwise, it may be manifested some mm -hmm. other way. So are there ways that are actually addressing it that are outside of MOE's purview? That there are actually larger things that we need to deal with? Actually, I think there is a larger societal issue in the following sense. I, I give some examples of what I mean by uh, following to, on what Jamie just mm. mentioned, right? So the first is the performance culture that we talk about. <clears throat> There's nothing wrong about the pursuit of excellence. There's nothing wrong trying to do better. But in trying to do better, as I, what I say, are you just focusing on the short-term here and now results? Mm. Or are we focusing on the long-term dispositions that we want our children to... Uh, embrace. Yeah. So that's one. The other thing I think that is becoming quite common is that, you know, life is full of uncertainties and untidiness. And whenever our children meet with some untidiness or mm. uncertainties, what do we do as educators and parents? I think see, like, if, kids expect their parents to bail them out or something. Like, ah, so you see, now, this, is a, this, this becomes a problem, right? Mm. Because every time if they get bailed out or if somebody is res made responsible for what they do or are not able to do, mm. then they will grow up thinking that, you know, this is not my problem, right? So I'll give yeah. you an example. You know? uh, some parents came to badger me to rescore their PSLE, uh, their children's <laughs> PSLE result. So I was like, okay, there's a formal process to rescore. If mm. you request, I will ask the staff to do so, mm. right? But I just want to make clear two points. One is that when it's rescore, I'm not responsible for it. The rescoring can go up, up or up, down. Up, yeah. And then they looked at me like, no. <laughs> it can only go up. Isn't it, like, isn't it supposed to only go up or stay? No, I said, like, oh, no, to be fair, if you want to rescore, then mm. it should go up or down, right? That's to be fair. So then they went away. And before they went away, I, I just wanted to ask them, I said, ma'am, um, the dad or so, I asked both of them. Mm. In fact, they came in, in, in a group, you know. I asked, yeah, I asked them one simple cornered. question. I asked them one simple question. I said, do, you, do your children know that you're turning up to see the minister tonight? Oh, okay. Don't know. No, I just... Okay, I probably lost the word. <laughs> but I just wondered, you know, if your children know that you mm. went to see the minister to ask for the score to be rescored, yeah. what do they take away from this? Yeah. I mean, let's think about it, right? What do they think about it? That means it could be like what Jamie said, you know, if something happens, somebody else must be responsible, right? Mm. And... It's, not, uh, it's nothing to do with me. Nothing to do like with me, right? Everybody else has the problem, right? Yeah. yeah. So my mom or my dad <laughs> will sort it out. Mm. And I'm fine. Mm. <clears throat> and I think this is not something we want, want to, to encourage, encourage right? Mm. So that's why in MOE, we believe that, you know, we don't have to 
overly protect, overly structure, overly provide for our kids and try to remove all uncertainty and untidiness because mm. life is full of uncertainties and untidiness and every uncertainty or untidiness that they are confronted with is also a learning opportunity. Mm. But sometimes in trying to solve every problem for them, we actually deprive them of that learning Please opportunity. Still. Okay. Right? You have three kids yourself. You know, you have a daughter and two two sons, and who are twenty three, fifteen, and thirteen. Am I right? Yes. Okay. So, how do your parenting style change along the way? Like, maybe some parents just have one kid, and then they're like experimenting. With it, but do you have like any parental advice? I don't think it has changed because I have a first kid and then a second mm. kid or a third kid. I mean, every kid is different. They have their different gifts, and we just try our best as parents to try and help them understand their strengths and weaknesses. Mm. So from young, I mean, my daughter and my son, they will know that they can't be excelling in everything and they're not expected to excel in everything. But mm. what I want them to know is, what can you do well? What do you enjoy doing well? And mm. how can you use what you do well to at least have a positive impact mm. <clears throat> beyond yourself? Have a positive impact on society. Mm. That's why I always advocate that, you know, let's tr us try not to just define success by our accomplishments. Mm. Let's try to define success by our contributions. Mm. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll jump in here. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, I was going to jump in. So I mean, I, I, will, I will say, maybe I will have me and my wife lean on a little bit more of a laissez-faire approach. Mm. A little bit like you, my son who's an elder child may disagree, but I would like to believe that I'm slightly more laissez-faire. But when I, when I try to advocate that, I also hold my tongue. Yeah. And I'm like, no lah, because then when, I, when my wife says, hey Jamie, you better keep quiet because not everyone is as lucky as we are. Not everyone may have come with yeah. that kind of social capital that we mm. have, the kind mm. of confidence yeah. that we have in where we are. So let's, let's not prejudge it. Let's not, yeah. let's not over push this narrative about let our children yeah. be who they want to be because there, there could be some people who really do feel that pressure. Yes. That, that, that the so academic performance. We need to know our kids, you see. Mm. We need to know our kids. So, uh, Jamie, I have to ask you, did you never like contact your parents, uh, your children's no, uh, in teachers? In those days, well, in those days there no was happened. no WhatsApp anyway. There was no, uh, yeah, like, who on earth were going to contact their parents? Stand uh, their, outside their teachers? school no, and be like, like, yeah. oh. <laughs> those, uh, The only time I remember talking to my, my, uh, my kids' Teacher. uh, teachers was yeah. maybe when they were in primary one. Like, you know, you, you have the first few mm. days of school and you talk to them and see them. Even that was quite uh, revolutionary. You know, wow, I'm actually seeing my son's classroom for the first time. You know, it's like, wow, big, big, big thing. Mm. Yeah. No, like, it, it's, back in the day, it was really not done. And if you did have to speak to your teacher, it's probably something bad happened. Yeah. And you don't have to just leave it, like, right? Um, yeah. So no, I never had to. But I guess there's also another thing that's happened more recently, which is, yeah. you know, this social media, this ease of communication. Instantaneous, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I think sometimes our kids feel it, and our parents feel it, they are incessantly being compared, mm. right? So, you know, sometimes I, I joke, you know, that we all, all take turns to make each other unhappy. <laughs> because, you know, when you post on social media, yeah. the nicest things uh, mm. that you're experiencing, whether it's a food or a trip, then someone watching it might be thinking that, you know, why am I in the dumb, right? Yeah. Uh, why, why, why am I not getting this? So, how do we have both our kids and our parents feel that sense of confidence? I don't need to be compared. Mm. I just need to focus on how to best bring out the best version of my kid rather than how do I compare, compare with somebody to, else, mm. right? I mean, people may give you all kinds of ideas to do this and that, mm. but is that most suitable for our own children? And is that even more suitable for our own family as, as what Jamie may, may say, right? Mm. Okay, so we've been talking about parents for a bit, but I also want to talk about the teachers. And, you know, ST um, and uh, Education Reports have actually spoken to teachers on who say that the guidelines might actually be a little bit hard to implement on the ground. So mm. what would you like to say to those people who say it cannot be done about separating work? from after school hours? I think in any rule, it's not the letter of the rule that is most important. It's the spirit of the rule, right? Okay, let me first say that I don't think my teachers all will say that, no, I will not give my handphone hands mm. Because our teachers are very caring. They know who are the kids who may have family problems, uh, family issues that may face problems outside school, and they want to let our kids have that channel. So if our kid uh, texts a teacher and say that, you know, I get thrown out, in the middle of the night. Mm. I'm quite sure my teacher will, will respond, you know. Mm. But that's quite different from if somebody else <laughs> texts you and asks, what's the spelling list tomorrow, right? It's, yeah. it's, I think we need to have a sense of priority, right? Mm. And let's say some, uh, a teacher from the SPET school, the special school, and 
the parent asks, okay, so today, how's my kid doing? Because it's a high need student. I'm quite sure my teachers will respond. Yesterday, I just visited CPAS and uh, this mm. is a special school for multiple disabilities uh, for cerebral palsy, mm. uh, CPAS West in Jurong. And the teachers are all very caring. And to them, it's not a problem because they are in constant communications with the parents, uh, right? On the mm. condition of the child and whether the child has shown any improvement or not. But those are special needs students. For the vast majority of us, I think our kids are just kids, right? Mm. <laughs> and and, and uh, no, during my time, I always remember my mother used to say, if I have to turn up in your school and your teacher call me, I'm, uh, you're in trouble, no? <laughs> you know, it's the reverse. It's like the teacher's in trouble, but the child is like, it's fine, it's fine. Yeah, that's a... So I think we yeah. need to give space to our children to mm. grow. And sometimes when they face an obstacle, I think they must also learn how to overcome it themselves. Mm. And actually, it's very important because if they can overcome it, without the interference of the adults, they become more confident. Mm. And then the next time when they face similar obstacles, then they will say that, yes, I can do it because I have done it before. But if every time they meet an obstacle and then we are here like, to Daddy, mommy, help sort me. them out, then yeah. they never have the chance to have that confidence mm. to say that, well, actually, I'm able to do this, you know. Okay. You know, okay. in psychology theory, I think there's this word, uh, this phrase called learned helplessness. Okay, they yeah. just got to figure it out and then see what comes yes, to pass, yeah. right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, another thing some teachers have said is that sometimes they face friction from the school management themselves mm. when it comes to separating mm. uh, communication between parent and, and themselves, mm. right? So what do you say to that? Like maybe if they face resistance from school management who say, no, you have to deal with the parent. Or... I don't think the school management will do it in that way. In fact, mm. most of the time, uh, in fact, all the time, our policy is that we allow the teachers to deal with it at their level first where they cannot, then actually we will step in at the school level to take mm. over the case. Because uh, in those uh, very small numbers of extreme cases, we escalate it, we get the teachers to disengage the school to take over the case. Mm. And in extreme cases, even the school will disengage and MOE will take over the case. Mm. Um, Randomly, we, how many cases does MOE deal with on, on, uh, in a year? Oh, many. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> many. Like, yeah. many meets like, do you see more intervention now than say like three years ago or is there a number that you can put to it? I don't think we put a number to it because it depends on how you classify the case, mm. uh, how you classify the cases. But I think it's, we do have a system whereby even at MOE level, sometimes we will disengage because when someone is so unreasonable, we will disengage. I mean, recently there was one case whereby uh, a parent uh, demanded that the teacher teach in a certain way that the mm. child gets certain access to certain teachers and not others. So she's almost like dictating how the school must run. And she badgered all the teachers in the school, badgered the principal, until the teachers were so stressed out. Mm. So it's one parent. Then the other 1,000 children in the school are all deprived of the leadership and management attention that the school wants to give to them. So that's totally unfair. So in that case, we decided, okay, the school will disengage. There'll be one point of contact, you come through MOE. Mm. So what, what, does, what did MOE tell her? Uh, it's like, so if she turned out in my MPS as well. So I, I will have to tell her that first, I have a few basic principles. I think the best way for us to resolve any of such issues, whether you think you're right or wrong, is to work with the local, at, look, work at the local level with the principal. Mm. Respect the principal, respect the teachers. Because actually, I cannot tolerate this where people try to... Uh, you know, bypass the leadership of the school and then to try and get the minister to try and uh, press down on them. I never do that. Mm. I trust my principals. I trust my teachers. Mm. I always tell them that, you know, I'm, I'm not going to respond to this because the more I respond to this, the more emboldened that individual will be to bypass. And I know the trick because if the minister don't respond, the next one they write to the media, they write to the, the prime minister and even the president and so on and so forth. But, you know, we, we need to be very clear that once you embolden people to bypass mm the system, then more people will be emboldened to do this. And everybody will feel that in order to get my way, mm. I will have to, you know, do all this. And actually the system will eventually break down. And when the system breaks down, everyone loses. So for that very small number of parents, what they are doing is actually most unfair to the to other the rest, parents yeah. and yeah. to the other children. And that's why I think the parent support groups are so important because mm. in many of these instances, the parent support group help us to call out such behavior. Because they are the yeah. one who is being 
Oh, this is like community yeah. policing. Uh, it's okay, a, not community it's, policing. It's like, it's like social media moderation. Gen- self yeah, moderation. It's self-moderation, right? Okay, okay. In fact, I have one example of one school. Uh, they did orientation when the children come in. Mm. Not for the children, but for the parents. Conducted by the parent <laughs> support group. Because the parent support group has an interest to say that, come, let's have this uh, code of conduct where we treat our teachers mm. and principals with respect. And that's mm. how we work with them collaboratively to best role model for our children and also to get things done. And that is a very positive testimony, right? I'm like, why? Why do you need this? Like yeah, in this day age, I don't know, Jamie. What, so what's your the take? scary thing is that even if you're trying to pull back a little bit, it also speaks to a certain degree of uh, commitment of time and resources mm-hmm. and emotional uh, resources of parents, which all makes it sound as if being a parent is just so difficult these days. Right. So on the one hand, uh, yes, we know that there are certain egregious case, cases of behavior that we want to eradicate. But I think that, that there will also be a broad basket of parents who generally feel quite stressed. Right. Uh, like whether it's in a pos- positive way, in like being involved in parental support groups, being involved in WhatsApp groups. I'm sure there are a lot of WhatsApp groups. Mm. So there's a certain degree of like uh, heaviness. And I wonder why we're, we're there. You know, uh, parenthood, yes, should be a little bit more fun. I, right. I think. Partly is this incessant comparison that we talked about yeah. because mm. you are so much more aware and, but, mm. and you feel that sometimes we, we all get guilt tripped by, others, by yeah. others who say that I must keep up with the Joneses, mm. right? And I mean, it can be very, uh, very, it can be subconscious, you know, you put a post there, oh, I brought my kid to this uh, event yeah, yeah, and yeah, this yeah, activity. Yeah, 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 yeah. Then the other poor parents will be thinking like, oh, I am, I, am I not a good parent because I didn't, mm. I didn't do this for my kid. And then it is a bit of a guilt tripping Mm. unintentionally and then subconsciously then I would think like how can I now yeah. do something else yeah. for my kid right yeah. and, and then it becomes a bit of an arms race and Ooh. instead of focusing what our children really needs mm. and want we start focusing on whether how do our children look in comparison with others. Yeah, so just like we need to get kids and teenagers off Instagram, we need to get parents off <laughs> certain <laughs> other platforms. Well, actually, there well. are parents who opt out of all these uh, yeah, chats good, because yeah. they. They're they, like, they, don't they, tell me about yeah, it, yeah, I'll yeah. figure it out. Because like, they just don't want to be caught in this incessant yeah. comparison. Mm. I think there's a positive role that such mechanisms can do mm. to share information, to share resources, helplines, and you know where to seek help and all that kind of things. Mm. But this incessant comparison mm. is perhaps not healthy, we lose our self-confidence, we lose our perspective of who we are, what we should do, rather than... Yeah. I think for me, it's fascinating about how the way teachers are viewed has changed. Mm. Like, I feel like listening to your anecdotes, it feels like teachers are a bit more seen as service providers because now they're demanding nah. that, oh, I need it to be this way. Like, oh, what's... So I, I made this very important point. Mm. I want everyone to remember in my fraternity that we are not service providers. They are teachers. There's mm. a difference between saying that I'm here to service you. Mm. And I think this is a very important point that you make. That we must not think that people are here to service us. The teachers are here to partner us in educating our children. The teachers are not here to service us. Because once mm. you say service, then it connotes all kinds of... Uh, yeah. A bit transactional. Like you, yeah, imagery exactly. yeah, yeah. And all kinds of expectations and demands, you see. Mm. I think... But instead, I think the correct perspective is to say, how do we partner one another mm. to set positive role models for our children and mm. together we bring up the kid? Because the kid is in the school for perhaps, I don't know, eight hours, ten hours max in a, in a day. But the vast bulk of his or her time is outside school. And, you know, in Chinese, there's a saying that every parent is the first teacher, right? We are mm. all teachers in our ways. Because we role model for our kids. And once you start to see teachers as service staff mm. and demand, then I think there's another very serious uh, implication. Uh, raising entitled kids. Uh, that is one, yeah. raising entitled kids or raising, uh, having more entitled parents. But there's another more important thing. Then who wants to be a teacher? <gasps> okay. Yeah, I was going to yeah. raise that. Yeah, who because... wants to be a teacher? Because, you know, in all these OECD countries yeah. and they have done many studies, right? What is the one factor that determines the quality of the education and the outcomes? It's not about pay, infrastructure, class size, maybe all that matters. Mm. But the most important thing is the quality of the teachers. And if you can't get quality teachers, your 
entire education system will collapse no matter how good the policies are. And I've spoken with my counterparts overseas mm. and they have told me this unanimously. Time when the standards start sliding, it is because good people no longer want to become teachers. Mm. And we as a society have to ask ourselves, if we want a brighter future for our kids, better education outcome for our kids, then we need the best people to be inspired and honoured and respected when they join the teaching service. But mm. if everybody treats the uh, teachers as a service provider, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. then I'm sure you, neither you nor your friends will want to be What's teachers. Yeah, right? so I was going to ask you, was there a tipping point where you felt that this treatment of our teachers mm. reached a stage where it was actually affecting your ability to recruit them into Not the Not so service? much in Singapore yet, but I look at the examples around the world and it gets and it worries me. Mm. Because uh, even in East Asia, there are teachers that have been driven to suicide, mm. driven to resign from the service, not because mm. they don't like their kids or don't like to teach anymore, mm. but they just don't want to handle this yeah. kind of pressures. Yeah. So it may not be that it is such a big problem in Singapore, but I want to make sure that I it nip this in the butt and it doesn't grow. Because this kind of thing is quite uh, insidious. Once it seeps into our mm. culture, our societal culture, then we are gone. Mm. And what I always jealously got is this sense of respect to honour our teachers because they take care of our children. So we must never allow this to get to a state whereby uh, it affects our recruitment. By the time it affects our recruitment, I think we are way yeah, past the point. Yeah, that's a bigger problem uh, there. Right? In fact, even before it affects our recruitment, it affects the morale of our teachers. That is already a, a warning sign. Jamie, you want to say? I'm sure we, we have our pictures of the teachers when we were kids, mm. uh, the kind of expectations that they had to deal with, uh, the kind of job skills that they need to, to mm. have was maybe one type. But now again, just like the flip side of being parents is so difficult, being a teacher also seems to be getting more and more complex. They have to mm. deal with so many other things. Mm. Uh, as you then bring in newer teachers, what, what are the sort of, uh, I know things like these announcements help shape expectations of what we, we want from them. But in terms of their own, you know, sort of emotional skill sets, in terms of their capabilities, mm. how do you see them evolving in years to come? Oh, in fact, uh, that is a significant point to note. Uh, in the past, we might have this mental model that teaching is a didactic process whereby mm. yeah. it's a pure transmission of knowledge, right? I tell Correct. you what I know. But in today's world, you think about it, sometimes, you know, we tell all our teachers, when you walk into a classroom, maybe some of your kids will know even more than you on a particular topic because access to information has mm. been commoditized. So it's not that uh, thing about just going into a classroom and uh, just telling you something that you don't know. Yeah. In fact, today, I think we look for a few differences compared to the past. Uh, first, instead of just transmitting knowledge, is how you facilitate the discovery of new knowledge. So the facilitation skills to bring people together, mm. um, check what they already know, bring together their different perspectives, their different strengths, and create something new is the new skill set required in all our teachers. And I say this not just for our schools. It is also the same for our lifelong learning institutions. So the ability to facilitate and a group learning to come together and create something new. Uh, so that's important. The second thing is what Jamie mentioned about, you know, the ability to help our students manage their social emotional uh, development. Sometimes in some of the high-need school, that's even more important than the mm. knowledge exactly. transmission. Mm. In fact, for many of the high-need school, we say that don't start with high-tech. Start with high-touch. Start with high-touch because we need to settle the social emotional foundations mm. of the children before they even start learning because if they are all messed up at home they can't be focusing on their studies right if they have so many things that's bothering them from boy girls relationship to relationship with parents they're not going to about to focus right mm. no matter how intelligent and or clever they might be right so that's the second skill set that i think they must have the third skill set that we are looking for are people who can do what we call bring in the capabilities of the stakeholders it's not the old mental model whereby mm. moe has Everything, mm. MOE will be able to mm. tell you and teach you everything. In fact, for many of the secondary schools, how do you inspire the kids to say that you, why don't you take up this uh, line of work, this vocation, uh, join this industry? The teachers cannot be the one to tell them all this because the teachers can't be in every industry and have mm. all the experiences in the world to share with them. But how do you bring in people from the companies, from the industry, from the alumni, from parents to share that, ah, perhaps there are all these options available, right? You see, who is the best uh, advocates for multiple pathways of success. It's not just our teachers. Mm. 
And so the people who have walked the journey in the industries, uh, perhaps in the business and yeah. so on and so forth. So I think we need to learn how to mobilize uh, all these uh, uh, skill sets beyond us. Mm. Then last but not least, I think now that technology is so available, right? Uh, we also need to learn how to use the latest technology in order to engage our mm. students and also lighten the workload of our teachers. Mm. Uh, you know, today, uh, last time you may st spend half a day to do a lesson plan, uh, especially for adult uh, learning, right? Uh. Mm. Today, you know, you have uh, models like AI models that can yeah. crunch you a lesson plan in 45 <laughs> minutes. But of course, you still have to take a look at it and then mm. make the adjustment. <clears throat> so there are technologies that we need to embrace and help our teachers uh, be proficient at it so that they can do their work better. Okay, glad that you mentioned the work plan seminar because you tackled the parent-teacher communication. That was the big news that came out mm. of it. So I want to ask you, what else is on the list for you to tackle next year or soon in the coming months? Well, we have our work cut out for us. I classified uh, the two sets of things that we need to do in this year's work plan as refreshing our mindsets mm. and then uh, honing new skill sets. So refreshing our mindsets is uh, uh, simply how do we balance our duty of care with our duty to allow our children to grow. Because sometimes if we are not careful, the more resources we have, the more able we are, the more we want to provide. And sometimes we might just cross the line to deprive our children the chance to learn. How do we reorganize our work so that we don't have a one-size-fits-all rule, whether people can come to work early or go back late yeah. or uh, come to work late and go back early. You know, all these kinds of things, I think we can relook at our own mindsets, mm. how to go beyond teaching to the average of a person's ability or a class ability. Mm. How do we use more targeted ways to engage our students according to their abilities? So there's a lot of things about our mindsets. And one other thing that we want to do about uh, our mindsets is instead of seeing teachers as joining us at the age of 20 and then teaching for 30 years, I think in today's world, you will need a more porous system. There'll be people who leave and come back mm. and join us. There'll be people who meet career, mm. uh, who are meet career and come and join us. And we have one in 10 who are meet career joining us. Are you looking uh, to in so I increase think that, that number? I think that number will increase because there will be greater porosity. Because in today's career, I think very few people stay in the same career and do it throughout. Mm. But when people come in meet career, they also bring in fresh perspective, yeah. fresh skill sets. So that's what we call refreshing our mindsets. Then there's the honing our new skill sets and those are the skill sets that we mentioned just now. How do you embrace education technology? How do you build up the social emotional competencies mm. of our teachers to help our students and to help themselves? Yeah. How do you uh, help our teachers to engage stakeholders so that we can draw in their strengths to complement ours? Mm. Right? So these are new skill sets that I think we will need to hone uh, in the years to come. Okay. Jamie, you want to take us home with the last question? Yeah, okay. Well, I, I, I must say that you're, you're hinting at the flexibility for teachers to come in different times and leave at different times. I, I'm sure a lot of them will be very supportive about that. But uh, uh, In fact, I would say that we are looking at more flexible arrangements yeah. for teachers because they have different needs in different stages of, of their, their life own life. Yeah. Mm. So, but I, I want to make this very important point is that I, I say this in my work plan, which is that we can have flexi work arrangements of all kinds, and we are prepared to try. But we must not have different ethos. Mm. Because the ethos of teaching must be the same. The ethos of teaching cannot be one that's so transactional or mercenary where you mm. say that, I'm only doing this because I have been paid to do this. You know, when mm. a child turns up with his problem or her problem with the, to the teacher, the child is not going to say, uh, ma'am, are you a uh, contract adjunct? <laughs> <laughs> a flexi adjunct, or are you my form teacher, or are you my CCA teacher? Mm. You are just my teacher, sure. full stop. Yeah, yeah. And that's what in the fraternity we say that we need to make sure that we have a code of conduct that is similar, regardless whether you are a contract teacher, a flexi adjunct teacher, a form teacher, a CCA teacher, it must be the same. Mm. We can do different things, we can cover each other in different seasons in life with a bit of give and take. Mm. That kind of arrangements we can try but we must never compromise on the ethos, mm. right? I mean, it's like someone say, what's the difference between a teacher in a school and a teacher in a, say, a tuition, tuition center? center? Yeah. Well, there's a big difference because the teacher in the school takes care of students of all kinds with very diverse emotional needs. Mm. Stu teachers in school don't pre-select who they want to teach. teach yeah. And they don't have this thing whereby 
sorry, my time's up. I'm not going to uh, oh. entertain your next dollars. question. Oh. Uh, it's not a transactional <laughs> yeah. arrangement, right? Mm. And we have many, many teachers who pour their hearts out and go out of their way to help their students beyond the call of duty. And we are very proud of that because that is actually one of the key ingredients of the success of the system. But mm. as they pour their hearts out and they do beyond the call of duty, then I think as society, we need to reciprocate by respecting them. Not just respecting them professionally, but respecting their private time, respecting their, the need for them to have time to recharge and very importantly, to continue to upgrade themselves. Because just now we talk about refreshing our mindsets and embracing new skill sets. Mm. Teachers need time to even sit back and think, okay, how can I do this better rather than just keep running on the treadmill to perform and to produce yeah. the results, yeah. right? And they need time to ask themselves, how can I take a step back, right? I need to hold new skill sets, you know, do things more efficiently, mm. even just to embrace new attack. I need, to, I need time to do that. So I think the best gift that we can give to our teachers, not on Teacher's Day, but every day, <laughs> is to give them the sense of respect yeah. and trust. And I think that will be what my teachers will most appreciate. And if they look at the parents, they look at society, respecting them and trusting them, I have no doubt they will go all out mm. for our children. Okay. Well, going back to, to your ethos, I mean, maybe last question, uh, I'll t uh, take that one. I, mean, I wonder whether is there a, a, a experience that you had as a child when you were in school that sort of shaped your ethos now as education minister, that you're able to see this need to support our teachers? Was there a teacher, was there an experience when you were growing up that, you know, that, that, that stuck in your mind that shaped your own thinking about education service? Well, there are more than one examples that I can mm -hmm. give, but throughout all this, I would say that I can give a, one or two examples, but the common theme is this. The teacher, my teacher, gave me the chance to be confident. Mm. So two examples. In primary one, uh, I remember that within the first one or two weeks, you know, my teacher just asked me, hey boy, come, you help me bring this stack of books to the staff room. Oh, that's a favorite thing to do. Yeah. Every kid wants to do that. Then I was like, wow, <laughs> I'm the chosen one. <laughs> right? Yeah. My teacher trusted me. So that inspired me to say that if my teacher trusts me, mm. then I must not betray the trust. I must make sure that I be a good boy. I do well. And so that I can continue to carry the books to the staff room. Yeah. All the other yeah. kids used to look at these kids very jealously. You know, like, <laughs> really? See, yeah, like, the one, the like one, teachers the, bad a bit, Yeah, no? the one uh, who gets to carry the books, you know, like, you know, yeah. yeah. Okay. But you see, then the teachers will know how to make sure spread that it out. Out, spread yeah. it out, right? Okay, okay. But, fairness, you know, a, a simple act like that, it can trigger mm. in the child a certain mm. sense of confidence, a certain sense of commitment and motivation. Uh, so even in a, at a higher level, I remember when I was in a secondary school, uh, one of these surprise math tests that we had. So everybody was like struggling. And then, but we all struggled, but the teacher gave us the confidence to say that, you know, even if you didn't do as well, like whether you score 90, 100 or whatever, even if you can just pass the surprise test, there's something in you without you having to mark and uh, things like that. There's something mm -hmm. in you. And, that, and then she nominated me to go and participate in the math Olympiad and so on and so forth. And suddenly it gives you confidence, right? That mm. there's something in you. That's why it tells me that, you know, the teachers are constantly looking for opportunities to affirm the kids for what they can do rather than what they cannot do. Mm. Because it's very sad if you get told every day by someone yeah. else that, you know, yeah. Jamie, why are you like that? What I do get you it all learn the time. from? I used to get, um, used to get it all the time. What do you learn from her? Right? <laughs> then, then you always feel that, you know, my whole life is... <laughs> Oh, it's being compared to other people. And that, it, it's not a very nice feeling, right? Yeah. But if instead, I mean, we as parents or mm. uh, educators, we said, hey, Jimmy, you're really good at this, you know. Why don't you use Thanks. this skill and do something? Yes, right? a positive you, affirmation yeah. is the way to right? go. <laughs> then suddenly, Jimmy might feel like, wow, <laughs> I'm the chosen one. <laughs> and then he might lead you on to something bigger, yeah. you see. So I think that's why I realized that actually across all generations, our mm. teachers always try to do that. Mm. And today, we must keep to this ethos whereby we help our teachers to find time to focus on helping our child to realize their potential mm. by making sure that they help our child to understand their strengths and weaknesses. Mm. And in that, we need to give time to our teachers. It's not how many things we do. It is the quality of the time that we have with the kids that's important. So I think 
when we were much younger, we t- I truly mean it that my mother told me, you know, you make sure you don't have my... The teacher uh, call you. You, don't make, you make sure that you, your teacher don't need to call me, you know. Mm. But that's the kind of trust and respect they have of our teachers. And because of that, our teachers are able to do much more mm. for our kids. But can you imagine if one class of 40 students, 80 parents, everyone calling the teacher sure. yeah. every day to ask from spelling list to give me a feedback on my child every day, then the teacher cannot be doing their best for our kids, right? And mm. then they will get burned out quite soon. So I think we support our teachers by respecting them and giving them the trust and the time and space to do the best things they can for our kids. Okay. So, Min, on that note, thank you very much for sharing thank your you. stories and uh, thank you, being thank you for supporting our teachers <laughs> as well. And thank you very much. Well, thank you for coming on the show. I'll come back anytime. Um, yeah. As I will say that to Jamie as well. Thank you for being a really? great call. Yeah. yeah. Okay. okay. One more test, maybe next right. one. <laughs> right. yeah. But thank you both for being on the show and for thank the engaging you. conversation. Now, as a parent, do you agree with the new guidelines? Tell me in the comment section below. And while you're there like, subscribe, or hit the notification bell to get fresh content from the usual place. Now, if you want to listen to the podcast version of this episode, you can catch our show on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or on the ST app. You can also find me on Instagram at theusualplace underscore net. I'll see you next time at The Usual Place.